satellites, uh, rocket engines, and the Holocene. This is my researcher. My research. I was a researcher at the Aerospace Corporation for um, 36 years, and I worked in the Ivan and Gating Labs, as they mentioned. And now, the USAF uses the Space and Missile Systems Center as primary launch responsibility for most of the operational satellites, like GPS, a lot of the weather satellites, and so forth. They launch out of Vandenberg, but the Aerospace Corporation is a nonprofit uh, company that supports them with scientific uh, know-how. So I basically worked in a stable of scientists, about 400 scientists in this Ivan A. Ginning Labs. Coming from all walks of life, they were a very interesting group of people, very diverse. Um, first, some background. All right, I'm only going to talk about facts today. Um, a lot of people have a lot of ideas and things, and beliefs are fine, um, but I'm not going to talk about any of those. There's this guy, Elon Musk, who says we're going to Mars, and it's, it's sort of a myth kind of a thing, but what I'm going to talk about is basically everything you know and love. You know, uh, computers, vehicles, air travel, um, internal combustion engines, and so forth. So the, um, the sort of the macroscopic physical universe is governed by these things called partial differential equations, like that one. If this is too bright, is this dot too bright? Is it bothering people's eyes? No, it's visible. Excellent. OK, so Nambier Cauchy equations, Maxwell's equations that cover electromagnetics, the Arrhenius equation, which governs chemical reactions, Navier Stokes equations, which govern chemical flow. So these are facts. These are things we use to build the, the world that you're familiar with and that we all rely upon. Uh, that's the kind of thing I'm going to talk about. And I wanted to mention something else. Um, I don't know if you're aware of Acri versus New World Communications decision in Florida Public Court in 2003. Set a legal precedent. Said, okay, the news, the U.S. news doesn't have to tell the truth, basically. It does no wrong if it distorts the truth. Um, yeah, most people don't know about that. Canada has the Radio Protection Act, which says the news must tell the truth. So the U.S. news can't broadcast in Canada because of the... So it's important to know that what you're seeing on the news, there's no governing body saying that has to be true. So why is that dangerous when we're talking about things like facts? Well, let's say these are some temperatures you measured on a piece of wood out in the sun, okay? Then you know there's an average temperature, you know how to calculate it, you add all the temperatures and divide by the number of measurements you made, and that gives you the average temperature of the piece of wood. Okay, well, nature invented that in the Big Bang, the mathematics of metric spaces, point set topology, physics of thermodynamics, and quantum mechanics. So we know why that works. Scientists could tell you why your common sense works. And it evolved as a uh, part of the predator-prey problem. But yet, if you go to look at different news channels, there's no scientific foundation between watching a liberal and a Republican and then <clears throat> trying to draw an average opinion. There's no science behind that at all. There's no topology, no metric space. So you might fool yourself into thinking, gee, I understand both sides of the story, especially when it's legal for them to distort the news. So that's a dangerous thing to believe. And the last comment I have is the power of hidden facts. And people will use this on you a lot. Like, see three numbers, one, three, five, their average is three, right? And then somebody says, oh, well, there's some other number I don't know about, but it's probably close to the same and so forth. Well, no, if you don't know that fact, it could be way off. So this is another way that the news can just sort of leave out a few important details. And again, the news has this way of tweaking things. And the last point is this. We've really entered the model age. Our models are excellent now. As an example here, uh, the latest class of fast attack submarine, the Virginia class, was built entirely in a computer model. Ordered parts, brought them together in dry dock, put it together, and it was the first submarine in history whose maiden voyage had no significant reportables. This tells you how good our models have gotten. And the reason I bring that up is because I'm going to talk about climate models in a minute. So, um, as long as we've got this little thing going here, correct science. As long, now, I, I just heard a great um, quotation. It's, trust science, not scientists. Because a lot of scientists want to get rich, and so they'll tweak things a little bit in order to get funding. Um, the world goes on. It's a real world. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is satellites. So 
There's a whole bunch of satellites, billions and billions of dollars of satellites up on orbit right now doing everything from weather to communications to all, all sorts of things, um, including monitoring crop health from space. You know, here's the, the uh, hurricanes we had last year, the destruction of the tidal uh, wetlands, also uh, deposition of uh, river sediments and things like that. So they're really, really important to our civilization um, for a lot of different reasons. But there's a whole lot of space junk up there. There's over 150 Russian upper stages just left over from the heyday of the Soviet Union and a lot of other things up there too. These are all blown up large, so you can tell what they are. There you can see an upper stage. Here you can see another upper stage and another, like I said, there's 150 of them up there. So at orbital velocities, which is about seven kilometers a second, you know, if a little ball of aluminum hits a big chunk of aluminum at that velocity, it basically just turns it into a plasma, just turns it into a gas of aluminum. And the shock wave is so large it can break off the back. So anything that hits a satellite at that velocity is going to cause a lot of damage. And that actually is a problem. Um, global warming causes more of a permanent hazard with this. What happens is, as the troposphere warms up, it's filling up with carbon dioxide. And that prevents Earth infrared radiation from radiating up to the stratosphere. So the stratosphere and above will actually cool and shrink. And so it shrinks away from the orbiting satellites and tends not to cause them to come back in. They tend to be more permanent. So it causes the space junk problem to get worse. Because normally they want the orbit to decay slowly and then this junk to re-enter. Um, in about 2007, there was a collision between a Cosmos and a Iridium satellite. You can see we've got 10 or 12,000 objects up there now that they have to track all the time. And these are objects about the size of your hand or bigger. They can't see anything smaller. So there's probably a lot more. So this is the Cosmos Iridium event. This is a cool uh, video that I downloaded to kind of give you an idea. So this is an operational Iridium communication satellite. What you saw before was the cluster of all the satellites and bam. The Cosmos satellite had been dead for some time, and they chose, because it's cheaper, not to track the satellites. So it was Iridium lost a satellite, but they don't care. Uh, they'll just you know, get insurance for it and then uh, launch another one, perhaps. But the problem is it creates all this extra space junk. And since the Earth isn't a perfect sphere, it spreads out into different orbits and starts to spread all around the world. Within a few days, it's all over the place, uh, all this uh, additional space junk. It was an increase of about 10 or 12% over what we already knew was there. Here's all of it in all the various orbits. I like this. There's a real one coming by there. That's out in the uh, Molnaya orbit. Um, so I had money to uh, Debris LV. It was part of the Debris Sat program. It was a NASA program uh, to construct a mock Russian upper stage, which is what this is, debris LV for launch vehicle. It's held together by rivets, as you can see, most of the Russian upper stages are. Nobody knew if the rivets came out in an, in an impact. I mean, that could add hundreds of extra particles right there. So there were a number of things they didn't know about, and that's me uh, mounting it inside this giant vacuum chamber. Um, this is outside the vacuum chamber. Um, this is at Arnold Air Force Base. This is the Range G light gas gun, the biggest light gas gun in the free world. Basically, there's a big barrel there. They throw in a, a, a projectile and bags of gunpowder, close it up, and fire the gun into this vacuum chamber. Vacuum chamber is a couple of football fields long. You can't see it in this shot. It's on the other side of that wall. But that's me standing inside of it um, after I put uh, debris LV in there. And I'm going to show you the moment of impact I can find the mouse, there it is. Okay, so you'll see the penetrator come in at seven kilometers a second, about orbital velocity, and then bam. And this is their normal experiment, so that's the plasma, white hot, coming out of there at uh, six or 7,000 degrees. Um, but we wanted to see if we could uh, understand the chemistry, and that's those three photos on the right, but I actually have a video. There's the penetrator hitting, and now you can see the, uh, 
molecular emissions of the species that are coming off. This is some sort of hydride uh, giving a purple glow, and then uh, this is a dimolecular species of some sort, bimolecular species of some sort. So this is the kind of research we were doing to understand. Turns out that's pretty important because that stuff is vapor metal, metal vapor. So here was a discovery, one of my discoveries. I call it space flakes. Um, so there's my fingers holding a tweezer and a little thin layer, kind of like when steam comes out on a cold plate, only this is uh, titanium metal gas coming out on a cold aluminum plate, and then it spalls off and goes into orbit. Um, but that right there is a little 10 gram flake, and it has the same energy at orbit as a 50 caliber Browning machine gun sniper round. So it can do a lot of damage. So there's a, there's a big concern here, but of course our current administration is defunding this kind of scientific research. I don't know what we're going to do about the satellites up there. Hopefully it'll be a while before we have too many other collisions going on. Um, we're just going to have to wait and see how that goes. But there's a lot of money being spent right now. They'll move the space station around a little bit or move <coughs> satellites when they see clouds of debris coming, but they can't see anything below a certain size. Mm -hmm. So last I heard, there hadn't been any major collisions in a while. So I'm going to jump quickly so I don't use up too much of your time to rocket engines and the atmosphere. This was, um, this was one of my main research topics. I'm primarily a modeler, chemistry modeler, um, but hypersonic atmospheric combustion chemistry. So you can kind of imagine the diameter of the Earth it's rather large. Uh, we live in a little tiny layer down here. There was my company at Baja, California. And there's a whole lot of solar, solar ultraviolet coming in from the sun that dissociates oxygen molecules and makes oxygen atoms and oxygen ions. And these recombine to form our ozone layer. There's a lot of stuff going on there. And the reason why I'm talking about this and why we're interested, this is a little better. You can see Mount Everest right there. So you can get an idea of how thick the area we live in. Here's the ozone layer uh, in the stratosphere. And um, this is the highest flying aircraft we have. And this is the lowest flying spacecraft while we don't have the shuttle anymore. Um, but there was a whole region here that we couldn't go out and visit and measure very much. We could only take quick snapshots. So the question is, what kind of complex chemistry is going on here? Because as you can see, the rockets take off and they fly right through this very important region that contains our ozone layer, which is not healing as fast as we'd like it to heal. So the way we study that is with models and laboratory experiments. So here's a model, for instance. This is all happening in a computer. What it's doing is solving those Arrhenius equations, remember from the first slide, and the uh, Navier-Stokes equations um, for combustion. And then this is all happening inside the computer's memory, kind of a virtual space. Um, hydrogen combustion is the simplest combustion. If we added methane, we'd need 300 instead of just 20 or 20, 20 or 30 reactions. Kerosene would require well over 1,000 reactions. But what I do is, this is my laboratory, this is my flame chamber, and you can see the burner in there, which is, this is the computer burner, this is the real world burner, and it's burning inside of a low pressure chamber, and there's a pipe here that goes up and over and comes down and goes outside a really big vacuum pump to suck all the gases out because we're trying to simulate the low pressure of that upper part of the atmosphere where we can't get to. So we add the chemistry and we make the low pressure and then we start the thing burning and we make measurements. And if our model tells us what we're measuring, then we know our model is good and we can begin to extend the results to what's actually going on in the real world. That's called model validation. So hydrogen burns clear. Uh, at visible wavelengths, so you can't see it burning there. But when I add some soot, it makes the soot really, really hot, and that's what you're seeing here. So normally we'd be in my laboratory and I'd be actually showing you this, but I don't have it here. So here's the computer model, which shows temperature, and then here's me putting in the soot, and the soot's burning up, and as it burns up, it creates carbon dioxide. So this is how we validate our models, so we can go out and study the stratospheric ozone layer and these rocket plume uh, emissions through that part of the atmosphere. I like to show this because it's fun and it has an object lesson. 
That's about a foot and a half in diameter, come on in, by 20 feet long. And it's a solid rocket motor, and that's why space is fun. Um, this is my 4,000 pound LOX hydrocarbon engine. This was built by a high schooler. Actually, he was an older guy, but he had only gone as far as high school. But he took out the books and he read the books. So this has been solved. Uh, a lot of rocket science. At any rate, uh, there's a guy out here. He's way in the background taking high-speed pictures. But um, So this is firing locks and kerosene. You can see a brown layer of film coolant that ignites and then all burns up. The reason that's white is because it's full of soot. That's known from my modeling. I mean, that can be reproduced. You need a supercomputer to reproduce it. But you know what's happening. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about the Holocene. And um, basically, carbon dioxide is the single largest waste product produced by the human race. Um, there's some sources here, transportation, car ships, rail. But they can all be electrified. And if you can electrify something, then you can maybe use renewable power instead of uh, the combustion of hydrocarbons. Aircraft absolutely require uh, hydrocarbons. The energy density of jet fuel is 20 times that of a lithium battery. So we have no technology at this point that we're aware of other than hydrocarbon fuels that have any chance of you know, running a 747. Um, concrete manufacturer, concrete's the second largest, most used material by the human race after water. And it when you make concrete, you release a lot of carbon dioxide. And of course, power plants. Um, so here was a really cool class I took. Um, this is going back 450,000 years. This is you know, a couple of different ice cores uh, from Antarctica. And basically what we have here, temperature-wise, is hothouse earth up here, which didn't spend, the earth didn't spend much time there. It spent most of its time uh, in ice ages. The last, we're here, by the way, and there's the Holocene. But about 200,000 years ago, our species appear in the fossil record. So we'll zoom up a little bit to about 100,000 years ago now. Um, at this point, there were Homo erectus, Homo florensianus, Homo habilis, Homo, hyper, Homo heidelbergensis. There were a lot of different species of humans on the planet. And us. And we weren't very different. Something happened right around here called the cognitive revolution, and they can see it in the fossil record, where we started thinking differently than any other human species on the planet. We tried to leave Africa here. They found settlements trying to leave through the Indian subcontinent that then just died out. The uh, Neanderthals were already there, and they were bigger and stronger than us, had bigger brains, actually. But they didn't think like we did after this cognitive revolution. When that happened, we left Africa and displaced all other species of humans. Um, there was a little interbreeding. They know that now. But, and they don't know the details, whether it was a war or whether it was just out competition. It was probably competition. Um, but we were the first large animal to cross open ocean to reach Australia. Within a couple thousand years, the megafauna was gone. Um, about 20,000 years ago, we crossed to the Americas, and within a couple thousand years, the megafauna was gone. There was an oversized lion, mastodons, and so forth. And then this was in and out of ice ages, very turbulent time. We were always hunter and gatherers because you couldn't tell what one summer was going to be like compared to the next. But then, if you want to believe in God, I mean, right there is about the most important thing that happened. It was the Holocene kicked in. Now, nobody really knows why that happened. But it looks like the Earth figured out how to hold climate steady. Of course, the Earth doesn't think, doesn't have a central nervous system. But And then all of a sudden, you know every summer is going to have growing season. And so what happens? We started off with agriculture, and then large-scale civilizations begin. So everything you know, everything around you, I'm going to talk about the younger dryas there in just a second. But everything you know, everything around you we take for granted is because of that Holocene where we have stable food supply and we can start running the earth like it's a nice, hospitable, warmed house for us. 
So the Younger Dryas was one of the last big, quick changes. Uh, this is from White recently at the AGU fall meeting. Um, was finding warming on the order of one degree a year for five years, and then a stable period for 30 years, and then one degree C a year for five years. That's rapid warming, 100 times faster than what we've seen in the last century. I'll show you that in a minute. So now the question is, how quickly is this that we've kicked off? How quickly is that going to change? So just some facts. So that, that's it happening there. And we don't know how fast. This was January through July. We don't know what the future is going to hold. The models don't do that all that quick. But this is sort of an example. This is called a radar plot. Really cool animation I found online. This is one degree C cooler, one degree C warmer, and no temperature change. And then it's going to plot the months around the outside. So this is every month worth of data uh, starting in about 1850. So I had some cool, cool times there. There was a real hot set of months. There's 1900, World War I, World War II, my birthday, <laughs> <laughs> graduate from high school. And you kind of see it spreading out. And there's the turn of the century right there. And then 2016, one degree C. Um, big change. Just, just fairly recently. This was done at the Hadley Center in Great Britain. They're one of the world's leaders. There's also a similar data set from NOAA and NASA. <coughs> and this is what my generation is handing on to our kids. I have grandkids, too. Um, done nothing for 25 years. We just fiddled around with crazy talk by um, talking heads on TV. And we went back to sleep, and we thought, Look, I've got a new car. I should be happy. You know, that kind of thing. So now we're kind of in a pickle here. We're at one degree, <coughs> one degree C. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, so this is basically every thermometer reading in North America um, for these time periods here. And you can see the, the average. They're just piled on there. They're not even average. They're just all added together. But what's really important is here. You're going from no extremely hot days to a lot of them. That's like a, a quarter or a fifth of all days. And that's a problem because that's not a linearity. What if that happens just before you're ready to pick your crop? Um, and these are the kind of things we saw in 2016. You remember planes grounded because it was just too hot. The planes weren't designed to fly in uh, Great Britain and Australia. Uh, this is the kind of thing that can happen in a severe heat wave, and then they've got to go out and fix it. You can't bring food in by train when the tracks are like that. So that can be an issue. There's about three days supply of food in any city. Um, Canada, Fort McMurray fire, uh, two, three two or three times the size of Prescott, just sort of snuffed by a wildfire no one could control, way too big. Uh, melting asphalt, which would be another problem, I suspect, for Phoenix. I don't know where our food comes from, actually. But civil so society has decided two degrees C is about the max we could probably tolerate and save civilization. This thing we've all grown to rely upon. Why not four degrees C? Well, there's a number of reasons. Can you imagine an uh, 18 degree heat wave in Phoenix? You know, uh, 140, something like that. Um, 40, half, half the food supply goes away. I know we're rich, we're going to pay a lot for food, so it'll be the poor people far from here, people of color, who will be the first to uh, get hit by this. But the IEA chief economist is saying six degrees would basically devastate the planet if it got six degrees average warmer. The IMF and the World Bank have come out stating that four degrees C uh, would cause our civilization to break down. And there's a big equity problem, too. 
50% of the CO2 comes from 10% of human beings. The top 1% of U.S. emitters have CO2 footprints 2,500 times higher than the bottom 70 million people globally. So that's 3.4 emitting 2,500 times as much as the bottom 70 million. So what's causing this to happen? Well, here's an octane molecule. Think of, sorry, think of your car uh, has gasoline in it, about 114 atomic mass units, but when you burn it, it mixes with oxygen, and suddenly you've got 352 uh, atomic mass units of carbon dioxide. So you can do your own calculation for your own car. One gallon of gasoline yields 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. So that's a pretty good rule of thumb to carry around. Um, America in 2015, more than half of all Americans, there's 51%, are at the federal wage poverty line. 1% um, of Americans make a quarter of a million a year. They control something like half of all U.S. wealth. A uh, thousand Americans earn more than $20 million a year. But here's the clincher. The more money you spend, the larger your carbon footprint. That's called embedded uh, carbon. If you buy something that requires a manufacturing process that releases a lot of carbon, then you buying that is actually releasing that carbon. Um, but basically, it broadly scales with wealth. So the more wealthy you are, the larger your carbon footprint is. And so here's exactly who's doing the carbon emitting. This is uh, the uh, Chancel and Piketty paper, 2015, came out right around the time. So there's 700 million people responsible for half world emissions. That's the top 10%. Notice North America here is half of that, about. So that's basically all the Americans. So basically, if you live in America, you're in the top 10%, give or take. I mean, there's, there's some Americans here, OK? Um, but the European Union has a, a lot more in this middle 40%. And then India, China has, has a lot of people down. But the bottom half of humanity, 3.5 billion people, or at least in any carbon dioxide to speak of at all. <coughs> so I just got my uh, ham license, and I was talking to a guy on the radio who drove a motor home 1,500 miles thereabouts to a national park, dragging a jeep behind it or whatever. And so I calculated he released about six tons of CO2. Um, if 10% of all humans do that kind of, that's kind of a modest vacation, then that's uh, four gigatons of CO2 released each year. So you can kind of see how these things we ignore. Now cars and trains can be electrified, and then we can use renewable non-hydrocarbon power. But air travel cannot be electrified. Um, and this applies to daily work commutes and so forth. Over half of all humans, that 50%, can't even afford this kind of transportation. But here's a really egregious example. So this is analyzed by that Chancel and Piketty stuff. Um, this an particular analysis was done by Professor Kevin Anderson. Um, basically, this guy here, private jet, private yacht, this is what we're talking about, embedded CO2 um, in helicopter, uh, private island. So he has about a, he has the carbon footprint of about 1,000 Americans, or 25,000 Zimbabweans. So every day he lives like this, he's telling 25,000 Zimbabweans that your life is heading for the toilet. Excuse my language. So that's kind of a problem, and that's how wealth plays into this. So we really need to look at uh, the whole concept of wealth. If only 2% of Americans were like this guy, then that would come out to the full carbon budget of the planet. So, and of course, the news doesn't tell you this, right? That's one of those large facts, the game changers, that you're not told about. Who knows? Who knows what's actually going on with all that? I'm sure newsmen want their lucrative jobs, right? So they don't want to get in trouble. But, so here's the IPCC carbon budget as of 2011. I'm going to explain real quick what a carbon budget and then try and finish up. 
So the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're primarily responsible for collating the net, the um, international scientific community's results on these. So as of 2011, uh, these are the budgets we have, and right here, 50% chance of staying below 2 degrees C, saving civilization. Uh, we could release uh, 1.3 uh, um, we could release 1,300 gigatons more of carbon dioxide as of 2011. But it's not 2011 anymore, so now we have 800 and 1,000 that we can release. And I'm not going to mention planetary boundary analysis, but that's very interesting stuff. So what is a carbon budget? Well, let's say you release 5 gigatons per year. That's a rate, how much you're releasing, for 5 years. Well, that's 25 gigatons. So you release, and then you stop releasing carbon and never release it again. Then you say you've released 25 gigatons. It's actually the area under this rate curve. Um, this is the real world now. Uh, these are the various climate uh, change. We knew way back in 1990 what we had to do. We haven't done anything. Um, you can see the rate of release keeps going up and up and up. How much carbon do we have to release? Um, well, we have an area. We can't change the past. That area is fixed. But what we do with that area, the <coughs> amount of carbon budget, remains to be seen. So we need that to be less than 1,000 gigatons. Right now, we're heading in this direction. And this is one of those cases where I'm not going to call that a fact. But I will point out that uh, this is my belief. Six degrees C is associated with the end Permian mass extinction. When the Siberian traps, a large igneous province in Siberia, belched forth for a thousand years and raised the carbon dioxide, they believe it raised the temperature of the planet about five degrees C. And then runaway uh, feedback loops took over. So if we do this, have all this area, we're heading for basically a global kill event by 2011. <coughs> Now that area I mentioned, if we want to stay below 2 degrees C, this is about the gentlest you can hope to do with it. In other words, you have to stop emitting carbon dioxide very quickly and start tapering off essentially to zero. That's where we're at now. The Paris COP21 was closer to 3.5 degrees, even though they pretended it was 2 degrees C for political reasons. But we've released so much carbon dioxide now that we have no alternatives to make, except to make rapid deep cuts now, within the next five years or so. We have to turn that curve over and start heading it down. So what does that curve look like? We don't, five years isn't enough to build a whole bunch of new nuclear plants or wind power or solar cells or anything like that. There isn't enough time. The only way we can stop emitting is to stop emitting. And then later on, if we get low carbon energy in place, then we can raise our emissions again. But if we wait till, tw if we had started in 2011, uh, we would have had to reduce in about 4% a year. So can you imagine 4% less gasoline every year? You can do the math. That's unpleasant. Well, now if we wait till 20, then it's 10% every year. 10% fewer airline flights every year. 10% less heating of your house unless you get a really good uh, heat pump system, 10% fewer car trips until it hits zero around 2040. By then you've got to have electric and you've got to have other things, buses, rapid transit, whatever. So this stuff took like a couple of years before I could get it into my head. I'm just so used to the scientific world I lived in, this laboratory that sucked power you know, in order to keep all these millions of dollars of equipment going. And the other problems I mentioned. So I could take an early retirement. I did. Uh, I had enough money to buy a little house out in the boonies out here. And I've got my carbon footprint down to about half of the average American footprint. But we need to be down here. This is what's going to save civilization. Um, excuse me, Patty, I sure. don't see that website, though. Can you? Oh, I'm sorry. www.carbonfootprint.com. No. Yeah. And there's a lot of different ones on there, and they go with a lot of different assumptions. Or you could download some scholarly literature and do some actual calculations. Um, 
but a lot depends on where you live. Just living in America is a huge, you saw most Americans are, even, even the poor living at wage poverty are emitting so much more carbon than the rest of the world. So how has this gotten out of control? Our generation has ignored, we've listened to talking heads for 25 years. Um, it's been well documented, Oreskes and Conway's books, how that came to be done. Politicians, they'd be kicked out if they got up here and told me stuff like I'm telling you. Thankfully I'm retired, you can't fire me. <laughs> Scientists have been defunded. Yeah, they were defunding me if I didn't tell them that the SpaceX rocket was clean as a whistle, no worries. Um, and scientists are really just ordinary people. They want to be wealthy. They want to fly to their conferences. They want to go places and, you know, be part of the jet set, this modern world that we've all learned to take for granted. The problem is this snuck up on us and we weren't really prepared for it. Another thing I've run into a lot with older scientists, this, Einstein was an example of this. He went to his grave thinking that uh, quantum mechanics was garbage. Um, but aging monodisciplinary scientists have been known to have trouble accepting new uh, information. So you'll see a lot of these old guys getting up there and actually saying things that are wrong because they have a vested interest in, um, in their old theories. Also failed economic theory and political and shareholder profits. Uh, corporations have been 50, 60, 70 percent profit taking rather than reinvesting it into uh, new structures and so forth. So this is all stimulated by affluence or the desire for affluence. So it's literally affluence induced climate change. Um, yeah, so just where are we headed? And this, this is the latest thing from the IPC AR5. This has really shocked a lot of people, international corporations, the reinsurers who guarantee all our uh, insurance uh, work. Basically, right now, given what where we're at, which is 450 parts per million uh, CO2 equivalent, we're going to come, there's, a, there's about a 1.5% chance that we'll come to an equilibrium of 6 degrees C, which as I mentioned, is a global kill. Well, what does that risk mean? What does 1.5% mean? Well, if there was a 1.5% chance that airlines would fall out of the sky every day, then you'd see 1,500 airliners. Would you even get on an airliner if you knew that day and every day, 1,500 were going to fall out of the sky? Yeah, but we're doing this with our planet. A uh, 7% chance of 4 degrees C, which means civilization is over, but it probably won't be a global kill at 4 degrees C. So yeah, this snuck up on us real bad. Um, although, there were people 150 years ago who knew this was coming. But it's really hard to get consensus when you've got people, because people like to cheat each other. People like to play tricks on each other. They'll, they want to get money away. You know, if you've ever haggled with somebody and they haggled you back and forth. Anyway, so some direct Prescott effects. This is soil moisture. Prescott is right there. Um, so um, this is now assessed out of the AR5 data sets. About 17 different climate models were assessed for this. So we're like at a 90% risk of uh, a decade drought within the next 50 years. Um, I'm not sure how long I'll be here meaning alive. Um, but above 80% for multi-decadal, which is a 35-year drought. Now, scientists tend to be conservative. I'm not sure they're being, I think they're being overly conservative here because a drought is something that ends, right? Everyone talks about a drought as something that ends. And here's some historical droughts that have happened uh, as the moisture balance decreased a lot. But this is a complete a complete game change here. It's not recovering. This is a new normal. Um, so they're calling it a drought, and the title of the paper was Unprecedented Drought Risk. But that may be disingenuous a little bit. But again, these are models. We don't actually know until we go there. But luck favors the prepared. Um, here's another uh, recent paper. Arizona is right there. 
basically stationarity is the principle that uh, all water managers have always used, that you have a climate like the Holocene and things wander around and you prepare for your worst case and your best case. Well, everything's changing, so stationary is dead. Anybody who knows the water managers at Prescott might want to have this conversation with them because they may or may not have been trained in water management, but if they have been, they were trained in stationary water management. And they need to be preparing for what we're going to see. Okay, so the Holocene is here. Everything depends on the Holocene. We want to stay there, but we don't know if we can. So we're in a climate emergency. This is not a message of futility, but a wake-up call of where our rose-tinted spectacles have brought us. Real hope, if it is to arise at all, will do so from a bare assessment of the scale of the challenge we now face. Ultimately, we must escape the shackles of our 20th, 20th century mindset if we are ever to resolve the 21st century challenges. This will demand leadership, courage, innovative thinking, engaged teams, and difficult choices. And we have a lot of really good teams here at Prescott. And it may be time for us to begin to talk to each other and work together and see what kind of um, changes we can begin to make. Robert Unger, you may know, uh, a philosopher, um, politician, at every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. I mean, what we see is this world we were grown up in, which is going away. So what can we do? Well, there are compelling reasons to halt nearly all commercial air travel. Uh, stop using dirty rockets. We, we just can't, we have no idea how to electrify aircraft at this point. There are compelling reasons why people who make 50,000 or more a year have to cut their carbon footprint very quickly. And we want to do this in as coordinated a way as possible. So my thinking is town hall meetings. Um, trying to think out of the box, building local resilience, town hall meetings. I may be running out of time, so I'm just going to blow through this slide. But I wanted to show you this. Hydrocarbon fuels must go away and fast. How about some electric buses for our highway out there? Now that's like everybody goes, yeah, yeah, sure, why not? But it's like, can you, can you conceive of that? And this is what I mean. So 10,000 Prescott women, and grandmothers and mothers, who care about their children and grandchildren, donate once per week the cost of a latte. That's $2 million in a year. You didn't know you had that kind of money, did you? Okay, you could probably absorb, afford one latte per day. That's $14 million in one year. That would buy 14 buses and pay the drivers. Uh, electric bus gets about 400 miles to a charge. So this is me trying to think out of the box. And if they make their husbands do it, we can get $30 million. <laughs> but I mean, there are other things we can do. Um, this is just an attempt at thinking creatively out of the box. And we have tremendous knowledge shared between ourselves on this sort of thing. So the most important thing is to learn to think differently and begin to imagine possible new futures. This wouldn't require our city council at all. I mean, we could do it as a nonprofit corporation. I mean, we don't have to kill the Republicans, okay? That's, we don't have to do that. A lot of people, yes, a lot of people think that, and that's, that's actually a problem. Because there's actually a genetic reason. There's a genetic correlate, a heritable element that produces, and it's, it's aversion to ambiguity. When ambiguity causes you fear, you tend to drift towards ideological belief. I mean, it's not their fault. Anyway, enough of that garbage. Sorry about that. Can we teach this to our children and grandchildren? We, this is a college town. But the college town doesn't talk to the retirement community. The retirement community doesn't talk to the college. So it's a little bit fragmented. 
And there will be tough social problems in trying to do any of this, which an all-inclusive, everyone, uh, town hall approach may help resolve some of these problems. But it's going to be hard, and this is why courage is required, because it's hard. Um, whatever the future holds, it will not look like the past or the present, but we do have choices. So our civic leaders can do a lot. They can increase support for local food, um, local businesses, instead of giving free land and hookups for uh, large corporate stores that we don't necessarily need. Um, local resilience building, instead of building new houses, you can retrofit existing houses so that people who don't have money or people who are struggling, we can actually live a better life. Um, develop legal options for local investing. So every time we buy locally, our money has a multiplying effect locally rather than shipping it off to, to Wall Street. Um, there are electrical cooperatives in this country where many, many counties own the electric company. And they all run it like a group out where I am. It's the Diamond Valley Water District. It's a bunch of yay who's like me who figured they could run a water district and they're doing it. This can be done with a lot of different uh, things. Rebuild, repair, reuse programs, the maker movement. Develop science-based water policies. Of course, I'm poking at the uh, uh, Prescott people. And we can do all this if we choose to work together, but it's our choice. And it's not necessarily easy. So I think this is my last slide. But there's a lot of information out there. Here's John Hopkins, Center for a Livable Future, University, of Press, University Press of Kentucky, uh, Yale University Press, um, uh, Fellowship for International Community. Here's a really good book. I actually have a copy if anyone's interested in reading it. What I found hard there, I like, I like science, I like equations, I like experiments. But this talks about how do you get people to work together, especially when they're yelling at each other in the middle of a meeting. That takes real courage and strength. But those are the kinds of things we're going to need. Anyway, I have a copy of that book. I highly recommend it. It's very diverse. I don't know if you remember from grade school, you had a reader. Yeah. And you know there'd be like a science fiction story. There'd be a novel. There'd be some poetry. There'd be all these different things. That's why that's called a reader, because it has many different things in it that all are going about building community resilience. We probably don't want the feds telling us how to run Prescott. They don't know in the first place, and second, we're not sure we agree with them. Um, but Arizona State University uh, is granting a master's degree in community resilience, so we do have resources. Our own Prescott College has a Master of Arts in Environmental um, Studies and Sustainability. So we can start working these things together, but I was in Wild Iris the other day, and there was a professor there grading paper, an engineering professor. I said, did you read the, the IPCC AR5? Did you know there's a one and a half percent chance of a global kill? And he just sort of goes back like that and he says, wow, that's huge. Because he's an engineer, he knew what 1.5 percent meant. But he didn't know anything about this. So he's educating these kids. And these kids are going to be like me. They're going to grow up and not know anything about what they're actually facing. 